Well, good morning, everybody. Keegan, thank you for reading that chapter one for us. That was a lot of reading. Um, As you can tell, uh, we're going to be in the book of Ruth. We're starting a new series today called Ruth, uh, The Road to Redemption. And we're going to talk about a lot of the characters that we just heard about and some of their circumstances. Uh, But before we do that, I kind of want to set the stage for the next several weeks for you guys, uh, give you some background information of the book of Ruth. I really feel like it's going to be important uh, for you to know and understand as we go through this series. Now, the first thing I want to tell you guys is that... The book of Ruth actually takes place during the time of the judges in Israel, or the easy way to say it, or during the book of Judges. And up here on the side screen, this is kind of what was going on in the book of Judges. If you actually, if you're looking at your Bible in front of you, or your digital one, if you actually swipe back one page or turn over one page, you're going to see the end of the book of Judges. And the last verse of the book of Judges describes this time as uh, Israel was a land of no king, and everyone kind of did what was right in their own eyes. So to illustrate kind of what's going on throughout the book of Judges, uh, we have this illustration. So you have Joshua, and then after Joshua, everything just kind of goes off the rails. So there's no unified leader any longer over them. All the tribes have their own space. And they all start doing what they want to do. And what happens is they, they start this vicious circle of, I'm doing what I feel like I want to do, and then all of a sudden, you know, because they're disregarding God, they're disobeying God, trouble comes. So they start crying out to God. God answers them. He comes, brings some provision. Well, then as soon as they have provision, it starts all over again. It's just a downward spiral to the end of it. And for the book of Ruth to take place during this time is important to know. And we also know that not just uh, at any time it takes place, but the book of Ruth actually takes place during the beginning of the book of Judges. And how we know that is because Boaz, who's another character in the story of Ruth uh, that we'll introduce you to later on during the sermon series, his mother actually uh, was in the book of Judges. Uh, I don't know if you remember... Um, Uh, the prostitute in the book of Judges that hid the two spies. Well, that was Boaz's mom. And then after Jericho falls, he, she marries Salmon. That's a great name. She marries Salmon, and then they have Boaz. So this timeline helps us put the book of Ruth towards the beginning of the book of Judges. And the second thing uh, that's important for us to understand and see the value of this and why the book of Ruth is so beautiful is Throughout the book of Ruth, the author never explicitly mentions God. So the characters will reference God, uh, and and you can see them all through it, but there's no explicit mention of what God did or what God said. And why this is so important to understand is because what the book of Ruth illustrates is even though it's not mentioned what God is doing, we can see that God is doing something behind the scenes that actually he's in control of everything. And just because we don't say God's doing this, we know that he is behind this, okay? So it's important to understand these two things and and, and look at it like this. So the book of Judges is kind of like, you know, the 10,000 foot view of kind of what's going on throughout the book of Judges in the the country of Israel. They're kind of the chaos. Everyone's doing kind of their own thing. They're disregard for God, but then they want God and all this stuff's going on. Well, then Ruth is kind of like a change of focus. Ruth is like a zoom in. You have all this stuff going on, and it's a zoom in. And what it allows us to do is see that God's grace is at work, even in the midst of his people disobeying him, that God's grace is in work. And not only is he going to work to redeem a family, he's actually eventually putting something in plan to redeem the whole nation of Israel and eventually the whole world. So, that's, I feel like that's really important information to know as we continue. And honestly, as I was pre- preparing for this week's sermon, I was thinking about this idea of the 10,000-foot view versus the 1,000-foot view. And I was thinking a lot of times as individuals, don't we kind of have to change our focus from 1,000-foot to 10,000-foot view in our lives? Meaning a lot of times in our lives we come across or found ourselves in circumstances or it feels like kind of everything around us is complete chaos and pushing in on us. So we have to take a step back, and if we don't change that focus, what's going to happen is those very same circumstances we're not going to be able to handle, and the pressures of that are going to come in, and what we're going to end up doing is missing out on seeing God's grace and provision in our lives. 
Now, one example of this in my life is when I was, as I was growing up, I never had a relationship with my biological father. And yes, it did have an impact on my whole life, but it really took root and grasped my focus. I wasn't able to see outside of this, probably in middle school and high school the most. And because of this, because this was my focus, actually everything that I did, I wanted to be the best. Every team sport, I wanted us to be the best. So when, when we got to the state championship and we were playing for that, like I was hoping my dad was going to come and watch. You know, when, when I was competing in, in individual tournaments for different academic things, I was hoping when I got to that tournament that was far away, that my dad would come and watch. And then in those moments, there'd be like that proud dad moment. We'd have that relationship, and we'd be able to share that. It literally became such a focus in my life that eventually ended up becoming a crippling point. It became, I couldn't see outside of those circumstances. It changed me, and it, and it even changed really how I saw a lot of the circumstances in my life, the other ones going on around me. I don't know if anyone else has kind of been there in their life. Now, I'm not saying maybe you're not somebody who's, who's been focused on a relationship you don't have uh, with your parents, your mom or dad. Well, maybe you are a mom or dad. Maybe you've got adult kids or young kids, and your focus is on that relationship you don't have with them. Maybe you just recently lost somebody, whether it's six weeks, six months, or six years ago. And you just get up every day and you just have such a hard time focusing on anything other than that situation in your life. Maybe your focus is on a job that you didn't get. Maybe your focus is on a job that you lost. You know what? Maybe you're, you're in school. Maybe you're a student. And maybe for you, especially in high school and middle school, maybe your focus is on your friends that you have in school, what they're doing or, or maybe something that's going on between you and your friends, or maybe your focus is on how little friends that you have in school and how you struggle to make friends. Maybe it's your first year of college and the transition hasn't been going well. And it feels like everything is, is, is just crushing you. Those are real things. These are real things, and they're heavy things that do need our focus. We can't just ignore stuff either. But if all of our focus goes on our circumstances, those very circumstances we're not going to be able to handle, and eventually we're going to miss out on those blessings in God's life because we're not going to be able to see them. To simply put it, our focus determines how we handle our circumstances and how we see God's grace in our life. And that's kind of exactly what we see here throughout chapter one with Naomi. Now, to be fair to Naomi, she's had a Oh, it's, it's really bad. It starts out not great, and it ends in tragedy, okay? So let's be fair to her. And, and as the chapter goes on, though, we're going to see that things change. But because of Ruth or Naomi's focus, we're going to see the consequences of what happens as a result of her focus being on her circumstances, so let's go back. I want to reintroduce you to Naomi and her family and, and kind of set the stage of, of kind of everything that's going on in her life. And then we're going to talk about uh, the results of her focus. So we, here we go. This is a fantastic picture. I did not draw this. Thankfully, there are much more skilled people that make stuff like this for people like me. So you have Elimelech, Naomi, Kilion, and Malon. And I'm going to tell you, Everybody pronounces those names differently, even the people that preach them on the internet. So whatever I said, that's what we're going to roll with today. But here's the family. They're living in Bethlehem. Now, this is important to know. Again, this is the time of the judges. Bethlehem actually is called the house of bread. And the reason why it was called the house of bread is because the prom, there's the promised land and then there's Bethlehem, which is like the heart of the promised land which is like the, the, the place that's known for like, and it's abundance of wheat and harvest and just all this stuff. Well, coincidentally, right now, during this time, the house of bread is actually a house of famine. and probably has a lot to do with everything that's kind of going on throughout the book of Ruth or the book of Judges. But we have this family, and, and names are important in this culture, so we're going to introduce our character. So Elimelech, his name actually means, my God is king which is going to feed into the irony of what he decides to do with his family next. Naomi, it means pleasant. 
And then we have some funny ones. You know how you go online and there'll be those videos that says, tell me your whatever without telling me your whatever? Well, if there was a video for this, it'd be like, tell me you were born in a famine without telling me you were born in a famine. So we have Milan or Malon. His name actually means weak or sick. And then you have his brother, Kilion. His name means tired or dying. So we have sick and tired, born during this famine. Nothing, nothing says I'm born during a famine like being sick and tired. So we have this family, and again, during the time of Judges, and then we have the father, Elimelech, whose name is my God is king. But there's a famine, and Elimelech makes this crucial decision to take his family out of the promised land, out of Bethlehem, and he leads them to Moab. Now, this kind of fits with the theme of Judges because, again, they're already in the promised land, but there's a famine. And Elimelech, it's not like he consults God or does any of this. He just decides, this is what we're going to do. This is what I think is best, and this is what we're going to do. So he goes to Moab. Now, this is only about a 30 to 60-mile journey, which to us doesn't really seem that far because we're, we travel everywhere, and we can get in a car and go. But for them... It would have been a seven to 10 day journey to Moab from Bethlehem. So, but this is where it really gets interesting. It's not like Moab's just another place on the map. And I love how the artist made it look like some scary movie. You know, the, the text is fantastic. And the reason why I did that is because Moab to the Israelites is like moving into the enemy territory. These group of people couldn't have much more disdain for each other, could very much care less for each other and the circumstances that both places were under. To make it even worse, the the Moabites were actually pagan idol worshipers. And their number one go-to idol that like when all else fails, if we go to this guy and if we give him praise, glory, and we please him, we, good things are going to happen. His name was Kamesh. Now, the interesting about, thing about Kamesh is to, and I don't even know how this, how this came about, but in order to please him and grant, give, grant his favor to the people, he required a human sacrifice. And most of the time, that human sacrifice was a child. So we see how Elimelech, my God is king, makes his decision to take his family out of the promised land, out of the house of bread, move them to Moab, where basically an enemy of the state, they, they're, they're living here, there's all this idol worshiping taking place, there's these child sacrifices taking place, and the ironic thing is, Elimelech moves his family from Bethlehem to Moab to avoid famine and death. But what do we see happens as a consequence of his decision? He dies pretty quick. So Elimelech's gone. So now, in Na- and now looking through the eyes of Naomi, there was a famine in the land. Her whole family moved to Moab. She's been surrounded by these pagan worshipers, child sacrifices. Her husband dies. So now she's just left with her and her two sons. Well, her two sons end up marrying two Moabite women. So if you want to go to the next slide. Orpah and Ruth. Now again, names are very important. Orpah's name... Uh, actually means gazelle, and Ruth's name actually means friendship, which we're going to see and talk about, that Ruth not only lives up to her name, but it's, it's, it's a part of how God uh, starts to redeem and change circumstances in Naomi's life, and we're going to look at that in a little bit. So they marry these Moabite women. Well, guess what happens? So they marry them. They're still living in Moab, and then her sons die. So sick and tired are finally out of the picture. <laughs> I mean... It didn't look good from the beginning for him anyway. So now we have Naomi, who has, again, famine. She's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons. She's in a foreign land. And all she has are her two widowed daughter-in-laws. And this has all taken place within about a 10-year period. And and what I want to point out is... (sighs) We might not be going through what Ruth is going through or Naomi is going through. We, we may have never experienced those circumstances. I certainly have never been a widow with two daughter-in-laws in a foreign country. But I think we've all been at a place where it just feels like and seems like life just continues to pile it on. 
we see though in verses 6 through 18, the narrative really begins to change. And we're going to quickly go through this. God, God returns, it says God returns, he visits Bethlehem, he's ended the famine, and then Naomi hears about this and she just decides she's going to go back. So she goes to her daughter-in-laws and she says, hey, I need to go home, but you should stay here. And now here's something uh, interesting is, is a lot of times when we talk about stuff like that, we think that um, people in their circumstances, when they're feeling tough, they're going to get nasty and stuff like this. But this actually isn't, it's not Naomi being nasty and pushing her daughter-in-laws away. What it actually is, is, is her showing mercy and grace and offering that up to her daughter-in-laws. Because she knows that if Orpah and Ruth return with her back to Bethlehem, they'll be considered outsiders. They're going to be foreign widows returning to a, coming to a foreign land. They're never going to get to be remarried. Life is going to be tough. It's always going to be a struggle for food and pro, just daily provision. So she offers them. She says, I got to go. Why don't you stay here with your people, your gods, your families, you can remarry, you can do all this. It's just going to be better for you. Eventually, Orpah does, kisses her and leaves. But then here we see in this pivotal moment where Ruth clings to her, and then Ruth says this to her. And I'm going to read through it and talk about it because Ruth is pledging herself to Naomi, but it's more than just her pledging herself to Naomi in the, in the midst of the circumstances. She says this, Do not press me to leave you, or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. She's pledging herself to Naomi. She's saying, I'm going to go with you. I'm just going to live with you. This is going to be the bottom line. But this is where the real gem is. She turns and says, your God, my God, where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, even if death parts me from you. That second half is not just Ruth pledging to Naomi. It is Ruth fixing her eyes, turning from Moab, turning from her people, looking beyond the circumstances. She just lost her husband. She's, she's, her mother-in-law is leaving. She wants to go with her. She's going to leave everything, and she does, and she points her focus to the God of Naomi, the one true God. And she says, your God will be my God. And if I leave you or whatever, may God do whatever with me if anything but death separates us. So in that, Naomi's like, okay, you're not going to leave. You're going to come with me. So then they head back to Bethlehem. Whoop, that was just that easy. So they head back to Bethlehem. And, and as things seem to finally be going in the right direction for Naomi, you think that we would maybe see Naomi being happy or, or at least relieved. Yes, she's been through a lot, and she might not have the greatest joy right now, but even at least a sign of relief in her life, at least something seems to have changed. Something seems to be going in the right direction. But we're going to see what happens when all we can focus on is our circumstances. So the first thing that we see happens, that, that Naomi does, that we all kind of can get into this habit of doing, is Naomi starts blaming God. We start blaming God when all we can do is focus on our circumstances. And we see this begins almost immediately in the discord when Naomi makes the, the decision to go back, and she's going back and forth with the daughter-in-laws. This is what she says to them in verse 13. No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So she's saying, I'm going back, you should stay, and because God's doing this to me. Like, she started this process. And then we see it again at the end of the verse, it says in chapter 21, she says, I went away full, which we know is not true, she left because of a famine, and the Lord has brought me back empty which again isn't true, but she says, why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity on me? And there is a certain amount of empathy and sympathy towards Naomi. She, they, they live through a famine. They move to a foreign country. Her husband dies. Her sons die. She's living in this terrible place. All she's got is her daughter-in-laws, and she finally has this opportunity to go home. 
And none of these circumstances, by the way, are in her control. She had zero control of what her family really did during the famine, zero control over her husband passing or her son's passing. She has zero control. But that's not the only situation where we find ourselves blaming God. I think a lot of us could say it. I know there's been points in my life, but a lot of us are in circumstances that are our own fault. And even when we're in those circumstances, as a result of something we did, when we fix on that, don't we even blame God sometimes? Now, we've, we've heard people, I've talked to people, and it's like, the same decision every time. They make the same decision, and then they're like, I don't know why God keeps doing this to me. And it's like, dude, come on. This, this, I can tell you what's happening. And it's that, but it's that idea of once we fixate on our circumstances, it becomes very easy to blame God. And the second thing that once we start blaming God that we start doing is we start not seeing God's grace in our life. We don't see God's grace because we're actively busy seeing everything in a negative light and blaming God. And, when, and we see this with Naomi. And we see it in, the, in even in the discord, you know, I love that section where it says, basically, when Ruth realized, or when Naomi realized she couldn't talk Ruth out of coming, she was like, all right, whatever. Like, you're going with me. And then at the end, we read in chapter 21 where, where she's talking about how she, she went away full and she came back empty. What if, you, what if you were Ruth standing there with Naomi when she's talking to these people? You, just tr- you, left, your, you left your land, you left you know, everything that you knew, you left all of it to go with your mother-in-law, to, to, to love God, worship God here with her people. You've made this journey with her. And then she's telling people that God has brought her back empty. Wouldn't that be awesome if you like, let's say you want like super friend with somebody who was going through a lot of stuff and, and you just over here having a conversation with someone like, I got no one. No one cares about me, nothing. God's taking everything away. How awesome how awesome would that make you feel? But again, we see that when we are focused on our circumstances, we blame God, and then we actively choose not to see God's grace in our life. And as a result of those two things, we see the third thing. The result is that it changes us. In verse 20, this is why names are so important, especially in this culture. In verse 20, this is what Naomi says. She said, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. So we talked about how Naomi's name meant pleasant. Well, now she's telling the people to call her Mara, which in that culture, Mara meant bitter. So as a result of her focus on her, on her circumstances, what's happened? She starts blaming God. She doesn't see God's grace, and it changes her. And I think... We've all kind of been there where you can get to a point where your circumstances just become overwhelming and you either become bitter or grouchy or just not pleasant to be around. And that's what's happened. And that's what happens when we can't focus on our circumstances or when we all we focus on is our circumstances. So which begs us to the question of how do we take our focus off of our circumstances? What can we do? Well, there's two things that I'm going to tell you lead to the third thing. And the first two things that we're going to talk about are things that we do not see Naomi do anywhere throughout these circumstances, anywhere throughout this whole chapter. And we're going to see um, how we can do these things because we don't want to be like Naomi. We want to keep our focus above our circumstances. So the first thing that we can do is that we can take it to God. So instead of blaming God, about our circumstances, we can take our questions, our frustrations, our heartbreaks, and our sorrows to God because God doesn't want us just to approach him in praise. God wants all of us, even all of our emotions, our garbage, all of that stuff, God wants us to collect it up and come to him and lay it at his feet and cry out to him. He wants all of us, just not our praise. And there's a beautiful example of this in Psalm 13, and it's a psalm written by David, and I just want you guys to hear it. I didn't put it up on the screen because I, I want you to hear David's anguish at the beginning, and he's crying out. 
but I also want you to hear what it means to take it to God. It says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O my God, my Lord. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. And here's where it changes. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. You see, God wants all of it because if we're giving it all to God, that also means we're putting our trust and focus in him just like Ruth did. If we're taking it to God, we're giving it to him, we're trusting that he's going to get us through it, just like David is. He starts off with, how long are you going to leave me like this? But he turns it around, I'm going to trust you because you've dealt bountifully with me. So we want to, first thing we want to do is we want to take it to God. The second thing is we want to actively look for God's grace in our life. And what this means is we need to be intentional about saying, what is good right now? What is God doing? Who are the people God's bringing into my life? What are the things that are not going bad? And the reason it seems simple to think about this, but it really helps us to begin to continue to place that focus on God. And as we uh, take it to God and we pray to him and we trust him, he's going to show us the things that he's doing in our life. And if we do those two things and we, we, we're trusting him and actively looking for those things, now real quick, if you're somebody, uh, I shared this in the first service, if you're someone who, who's like in that pressure situation and you're like, what are these things, how, do, how does thinking about this help? Write it down. If you're someone who's a journaler, or a sticky note person, or whatever, start writing down where you're seeing God show up in your life. Whether it's small, big, or whatever, start writing those things down. And what you're going to actually do is God's going to start to build a ladder of grace in your life. And that's going to help you get up over those circumstances and see beyond them. And when we do those things, what happens, again, is that third thing we just kind of mentioned, and that is your view of your circumstances will change instead of your circumstances changing you. Matthew Henry, who is a famous British pastor, uh, he lived a very, 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 very long time ago. And if you've ever uh, studied Bible or anything like that and you've got a commentary, the Matthew Henry commentary is actually, this guy wrote it. Well, anyway, on this idea of changing uh, the view of our circumstances, he was robbed. And after he was robbed, he got home, and this is what he wrote. He said, Lord, I thank you that I have never been robbed before, that although they took my money, they spared my life, that although they took everything, it wasn't very much, that it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed So we see the difference of perspective of our circumstances and when we stop blaming God, we stop looking for his things, we start looking for his things, we take it to God, it changes our perspective. And we're at the end of chapter one, uh, we heard Naomi's, Naomi's focus caused her to do all those things. Naomi's focus caused her to blame God, not see his grace, and eventually it changed who she was. And we don't want to be like Naomi, do we? We don't want to be sulking around, blaming God for everything, not seeing the good that he's doing, and missing out on his grace. We actually want to be like Ruth. Because Ruth doesn't blame God, but she pledges her life to him. In the midst of her circumstance, in the midst of her losing her husband and her mother-in-law leaving, she doesn't blame God. She doesn't become sorrowful. She actually pledges her life to God. And because of that, she was able to focus on everything outside of her circumstances. 
she was able to see God's blessing in her life. And eventually, God's going to use her to not just change Naomi's life, but change the life of Israel and even the rest of the world. We want to be like Ruth. We want to take our circumstances to God. We want to see his goodness. And just like Ruth, the best thing about it is when we're in that mindset, we also become a blessing to the others around us. So let's be like Ruth, and let's not be like Naomi. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much that even though we read through the book of Ruth and it doesn't say God did this, said this, or moved this, Lord, it's obvious that you're orchestrating everything. And it says more than we can read, Lord, that this isn't just the same for Ruth and Naomi and the circumstances for Israel. This is all of us. That every single one of us, you know all of our circumstances. You know everything that's going on, and you are working behind the scenes to mold and shape everything for your glory. And God, I pray for uh, the people that might be in here today that they don't have a relationship with you. They don't know how to take it to you. Lord, I pray that you're working on their hearts. I pray that, that just like Ruth pledged herself to you, Lord, I pray that you'd be working on hearts and that they would come to a place where they would pledge their life to you as well, Lord. That they would know fully what it means to give you their circumstances, to see your grace and your blessing in their life. Lord, and to have our view of our circumstances changed by your grace and your love for us. We pray for all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.